Good morning, men. So last week, when we talked about keeping your word, I used an illustration how some shingles had come off my roof during a hurricane a few years ago, needed to get it fixed. A couple people had given me their word they would fix it. They hadn't. So after the Bible study, one of our men came up to see me and he said, I'll have I'll have a crew out at your house on Monday morning to get that fixed. And I said, uh, do I have your word on that? <laughs> and sure enough, on Monday morning, crew came out, Miguel and Diego, and did a great job fixing it. And so I just thought that was outstanding. So I thought this morning that I would mention that I've been thinking about retiling my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a little joke. <laughs> well, this morning, our topic is going to be how to treat someone who mistreats you. And I think this is going to be a very personal message for many of us. It might be, for example, that you have a competitor who has become a rival and they never pass up an opportunity to run you down to potential customers, or I guess it could be that you would be the one who has a competitor and they're your rival and you're running down your competitor to potential customers, or I guess it could be both. It could be that you have a, a neighbor and you have a boat legally parked on the side of your house, but they keep calling the building code enforcement department and having people come out. They've been out six times and you're kind of feeling harassed about this. How do you handle these things? It could be that because of your faith that a family member ridicules you on a regular basis, how do you deal with that? How do you treat people who are mistreating you? And so we're going to look this morning at the advice that Jesus has to offer. We're going to be looking again in the Sermon on the Mount. We're at Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. And let's read these 11 verses, this text. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven." He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, Jesus is giving us <clears throat> more uh, today on the great reversal of all human values. And He's given us two radical instructions here. First, Jesus says, repay evil with good. And His second instruction is, love and pray for those who mistreat you. Those are the two radical instructions that are coming out of here today. And so, what we want to answer the question is, why did he say this? And then also, how can we apply it 
in our lives, and so we'll talk about some real-world uh, application. <clears throat> so first of all, let's talk about how Jesus says that we should repay uh, evil with good. Now, in the construction of the Sermon on the Mount, he has said up in uh, chapter 5, verse 20, that I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not getting to heaven. And then he gives six examples. And th these two are the fifth and the sixth example in, in, in this, in this uh, discourse. So let's take a look at it again. Verse 39. <clears throat> but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Um, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, is, can anybody think of an example in the Bible where something like this happens? You may, some of you, recall that when Jesus was arrested in John chapter 8, John chapter 8, 18 maybe, he was slapped in the face, but he did not retaliate. Now, Jesus didn't go like that. And that's not what it's talking about doing here. This would be a good place for us to, to mention that this is not replacing one law, the Mosaic law, with a new kind of law. Uh, instead, what this is doing, this is replacing the Mosaic law with the spirit of the law. And so what, what Jesus is interested in communicating here is what the spirit of his law is. And so these are examples not necessarily meant to be taken completely literally, though I guess perhaps in some cases you could, but rather to give us an indication of what our, what our inward man ought to be towards someone who is mistreating you. So somebody, so, okay, so somebody slaps you, okay, don't retaliate. Don't resist that evil person. Someone sues you and wants to take your tunic, the tunic would be the inner garment in the Hebrew culture. The cloak would be the outer garment. Someone wants to take your inner garment, fine. Offer them the outer garment too. Don't, don't resist. Get the idea? It's about the spirit, uh, the spirit of the law, not necessarily just the, the letter of the law. Reading on. So if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, Go with him two miles. In ancient cultures, it was common for countries to give the uh, power to military uh, people to uh, take a civilian and help them transport cargo or armament. And so a Roman centurion walking along might see a Jew and force that Jew to stop doing whatever they're doing and take and help transport their cargo. And they might say, you know, I want you to carry this for a mile. And Jesus is saying, when somebody forces you to do that, you're, the, the, the spirit of the law, the attitude that I want you to have towards your opponent is that you're willing to take it two miles. You're willing to take it two miles. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, why does he do this? And... What, is, what does it accomplish? What's happening here is that when we live like this, it invests the gospel with power. Jesus is telling us here to follow His example. <clears throat> Jesus was maligned Jesus was wrongly accused. Jesus got slapped around. Jesus got scourged. Jesus was taken unjustly and put to death. And he has given us an example that he's asked us to follow. The authority, if you think about this, the authority and the power behind the witness of Jesus is not that so much that he said he was the Son of God, but what he was willing to do as the suffering servant to prove that he was, in fact, 
somebody so extraordinary that we should pay attention to him. And he's laid down an example for us to imitate so that people will look at our lives and see something so unusual that there will be power invested in our response. Keep your finger here and turn over to Philippians chapter 2. You know, maybe one of the most agonizing of all these kinds of situations. Some of you probably have had a friend, and that friend is now your bitter enemy. <clears throat> you know, how do you how do you treat that person? <clears throat> I, I I don't know. I since I don't have any enemies, but. Uh, <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Watch this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And he humbled himself and became obedient to death. And so... <clears throat> What Jesus is telling us is that we, like him, should follow his example and, and lay aside our privilege. General Robert E. Lee one day was overheard by another officer speaking to President Jefferson Davis. And he was giving a report to President Davis about another general, and he was giving this very glowing report. Well, the man who overheard this later pulled Lee aside. He said, what in the world are you thinking about doing? Don't you know that that man is your bitterest rival? He, he misses no opportunity to disparage you and to malign you. So why are you speaking so well of him to President Davis? And his response was, President Davis asked me my opinion of him, not his opinion of me. Robert, Lee, Robert E. Lee, by all accounts, may be one of the great Christians of history, and he understood this text, this example laid down. He understood the power that gets invested in the gospel of Jesus when we live according to the example of Jesus. And here's the big idea today. Nothing displays the power of the gospel more than to answer mistreatment with love, with agape. My utmost for is highest. You know, I own a lot of books. Some of my books own me. This is one, My Utmost for is Highest by Oswald Chambers. <clears throat> On July 14th, it's 365 readings for those of you who are not familiar with it. <clears throat> He's, he writes this, When you are insulted, you must not only not resent it, but make it an occasion to exhibit the Son of God. You cannot imitate the disposition of Jesus. It is either there or it is not. The teaching of the Sermon on the Mount is not do your duty, but do what is not your duty. The disciple realizes that it is his Lord's honor that is at stake in his life, not his own honor. We always are looking for justice. The teaching of the Sermon on the Mount is never look for justice but never cease to give it. Isn't that beautiful? And nothing displays the power of the gospel more than this. Nothing. Okay. Now, on to the uh, second instruction, to love and pray for those who mistreat us. Verse 43. <clears throat> you have heard that it was said, love your enemy, and hate your, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Yeah, like I said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, actually, this was, again, one of the 
the additions that the Pharisees added to the law. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say, hate your enemy. It doesn't say that anywhere. So, you have heard it said, was not the Mosaic law in this particular case. The first part was, um, love your neighbor, but not hating your enemy. Jesus says then, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? That you may be the sons of the Father in heaven. Well, what kind of love is this? It says, you know, love your enemies. This is the, this is the agape love. That's what this is. And agape love means to love in a moral way. It does not mean to have personal affection. In other words, it doesn't mean that you really actually necessarily like this person or appreciate what they're doing to you. But because of our faith in God, and that's, by the way, for God so loved the world, that's an agape love too. He doesn't like us. I mean, he, I mean, he may like you, but probably not. <laughs> but, he, but he agapes you in a moral way. His love for you is... is it, His love for you is a moral love. It's not this sense of personal affection. I mean, we're God-haters. Why would he like a God-hater? No, it's because of his very nature and character that he agapes us. It's, It's a gracious kind of love. It's not an earned kind of love. And that's what he's asking us to reproduce here when he tells us to love our enemy. We love our neighbor, okay? But we love our enemy, and we we love our enemy in in an agape way. Not because of some kind of affection that we have for them necessarily, the neighbor that keeps calling out the code enforcement people, or or the uh, or the son-in-law who keeps ridiculing you for your faith, okay, or or your competitor who keeps beating you to your, to your customers on cold calls and telling them what a crummy company you are. It's not that you like them, <laughs> have a personal affection for them, but you agape them. You you make a decision that you're going to love them because it's the right thing to do. Romans 5.10 tells us that we were enemies of God when He reconciled us to Himself. We were His enemies. And so, He's telling us to have this same kind of approach to people. Verse 45 says this, second half of it. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. But why would He do that? This is what the theologians call common grace. Some of you may have heard of that before. Special grace is the grace that leads to salvation. For by grace we are saved through faith. Common grace, though, is the grace that God gives to all men. Oxygen, sunshine, rain on the crops of the, uh, of, the, of the unbeliever that are in the field right next to the crops of the Christian. This is God's common grace, and He extends it to, to all people. And, and He's giving us an example. It's, a, it's an example of how God treats people. He treats the, he treats the unchristian, the non-Christian, many times in the same way that he treats the Christian. Well, why does he do this? God has higher purposes, and why should we do it? Because God has higher purposes for our enemies than merely getting human justice. God, our Savior, wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked. He is patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. For God so agape the world that He gave His one and only Son so that whosoever would believe in Him wouldn't perish, but would also have eternal life. That's why, that's why God extends common grace. That's why 
God loves His enemies. That's why He tells us, one of the reasons, He tells us to love our enemies and love those who revile us and persecute us and not only love them, but pray for them. Wow, is this, this is the great reversal of all human values. I mean, really. Verse 46. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? I had my uh, personal counselor tell me one time, I was uh, reaching out to this person, and, uh, and the counselor was saying, well, that's because you love them, not because they love you. I said, well, of course they love me. And my counselor said, no, no, no. Uh, what, that, what this person loves is they love you loving them. <laughs> And you know what? I, I almost bought into what my counselor was saying. That, but, but after reading this passage this week, I realized that that's my duty. That's my duty. It's to love this person whether or not they love me in return. And, uh, and if they love me loving them, then maybe that is something that leads them closer to Jesus. Who knows? But that's our responsibility. Reading on. Verse 47, and if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than the others? Don't even the pagans do that. Love those who don't love you. Pray for them. Love and pray for those who mistreat you. In the early church, there were three charges that were being leveled against the early Christians. Treason, cannibalism, and sexual immorality. Early Christians were being accused of treason because they would not pledge allegiance to the emperor. They were being accused of cannibalism because they kept talking about eating the body of Christ and drinking his blood. And people misunderstood this. And they got accused of sexual immorality because they kept talking about giving the, the kiss of peace. And so there's all this kissy stuff going on. And their enemies took, took every opportunity to twist these things, you see. I mean, the kiss of peace. I mean, how can you twist that into sexual immorality? Well, you know, because you've done things and you've had them twisted around. How in the world did she ever understand that? <laughs> That's not even close to what I was trying to say. You know what I'm talking about. And so, Julian, who was the emperor of the Roman Empire, one of the in the 300s. His name was Julian the Apostate because he hated Christians. He persecuted them and he reviled them and he maligned them and he did everything he could to, to deconstruct Christianity. But what was interesting, because the Christians were so committed to loving each other and loving the unlovely, that Christianity was spreading like wildfire throughout the Roman Empire. And, and the more he tried to suppress it, the more it grew. Finally, he exclaimed, he said, those impious Christians, they don't only take care of their own poor, they take care of ours too. History records that Julian was the last non-Christian emperor of Rome. Christianity overtook the Roman Empire because of the application of this principle. By the way, as an aside, this is often used as the argument for, for uh, national pacifism. And uh, the, uh, it's, one thing in my reading this week is just the idea, uh, this is not my thing to talk about, but you should, it should be talked about, I suppose, that any time anytime you take a reading of text and come away with some unreasonable conclusion, it's probably unreasonable. Or anytime you take away from a text, you, you twist it around so that you come up with something that's impossible to do, that's probably also incorrect. God is a God of order and common sense and wisdom. And so um, this is not to be taken when, uh, when it says, do not resist an evil person. This, this doesn't mean that you allow enemies to invade your borders 
and put your people into slavery and suppression or something like that. That's a complete misreading of the text. But when we do, as Christians, what these early Christians were doing, loving the unloving, taking care of not only our own poor, but but the poor. When, When we invite everybody to the homeless shelter, we are investing the gospel with unique power. And that's the big idea. Nothing displays the power of the gospel than to, more than answering mistreatment with agape. And now how about some real-world application? Let me give you two, uh, two or three. Number one is that if, if we will apply, or the more we apply this principle, and some of you, of course, are already applying this evenly and distributing it throughout your whole, every, every sphere, that's great. The first application is that this can release you from bondage to planning retaliation, plotting revenge. A man had a huge dispute with his mother. His mother said some things about his wife that were simply not true, but were also very ugly. He vilified this man's mother. And then she left the house in a huff. And a big row uh, followed. And ultimately, though, this man decided that he needed to forgive his mother without regard to whether or not she forgave him. And when he did that, when he didn't, when he didn't uh, try to escalate the problem... But when he just simply forgave her, it set him free. She was still in prison. She was still filled with with anger and and raging about, just basically a crotchety old woman. But that was her problem, not his. He had been released from the bondage by by the application of this, this idea. And then secondly, and so the big idea again, So nothing displays the power of the gospel more than to answer mistreatment with agape. I think this, second application, I think this puts a ban on all forms of racial and ethnic hostilities. I think this completely I don't think there's any place in the life of a Christian for any kind of... uh, And I'm talking about... I'm really not just talking about um, what's said in public. I'm also talking about what's thought in private. If you have racial or ethnic hostilities of any kind, um, the command of, of Scripture is that we are to agape all other people and a you kind of need to deal with that. If you're a road rager, you need to deal with that. The mistreatment that you get. If you have had one of your family members disown you, you, you need to deal with that. If you find yourself in, in a constant power struggle with your wife because you feel like she's mistreating you, you need to deal with that. You need to answer mistreatment with agape. And when we do, this invests the gospel of Jesus with power. Okay, and then the third application would be that this, the application of this can add power to our witness. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, one day was waiting to get on a boat and he had reserved this boat in advance. He was not dressed like an American. He was dressed like a Chinaman at the time. And it was uh, rainy and muddy, and a a wealthy Chinese businessman, uh, very full of himself, came and uh, pushed his way to the front of the line to get on the boat. And in the process of doing that, pushed so roughly against Hudson Taylor that he fell in the mud. And it was covered with slop. 
And Taylor got to his feet. The businessman was trying to get on the boat. And the owner of the boat said, this foreigner here had made a reservation to come on the boat before you. And that was a very big deal at the time. So Hudson Taylor, instead of retaliating, he invited the Chinese businessman to come on the boat with him as his guest and use that as an opportunity to talk about the reconciling power of the gospel. And it's reported made a huge impression on that businessman. That's the big idea. Nothing displays the power of the gospel more than answering mistreatment with agape, with agape. And verse 48 says, this is the result. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This word perfect really means complete or mature in Christ. And it's not referring, it's not referring to degrees of goodness, but a, but a kind of goodness, that you would be complete in Jesus. This may be one of the highest tests, one of the highest plateaus to which we could ever possibly ascend. Not answering mistreatment, not meeting fire with fire, it's basically... Make love, not war. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for uh, telling us things that nobody else has ever told us, helping us to think in ways that nobody ever else has ever uh, helped us to think. Lord, thank you for changing our lives through the gospel. Thank you for investing the gospel with power by the the example of many of us were drawn to, to you because of the way uh, people handled our mistreatments of them. We pray the same would be true of people who mistreat us in the way that we treat them. Lord, I pray that you would invest us with the power of the gospel today by handling our mistreatments, answering them with agape. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.